Streaming and serving Anna Fayetteville, Georgia, you are listening to the New Vision Church podcast, a community to belong, be loved, and believe. Let's check out today's message. So uh, last week, we were talking about being imitators of God, and um, we were talking about how children can imitate their fathers, right, by putting on their dad's shoes, and sometimes it can feel a little clunky. Sometimes you can feel like, you know, this doesn't fit. I don't, I don't know how to do this well, and I want you to understand that loving other people isn't always easy or comfortable. Loving other people isn't always something that we naturally may know how to do. Sometimes you've got to learn how to love. Sometimes, you know, listen, there are the, those of you who are, who are married, and today we are going to talk about, you know, husbands and wives and children, uh, because you can't, you can't get around that when we're talking about relationship status. But, but those of you who, when you remember when you first got married, you thought you knew them. <laughs> yeah. And then you woke up the day after the honeymoon, and you said, I don't know this person at all. Right? Who is this? Who is this? Right? And I mean, hair's all out to here, you know, no makeup on, bad breath. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's who you married. That's the way it works. Because they, you're not always going to look like that. You're not always going like to look like the cover on the magazine every day. And, and, and so you got to, sometimes you got these idiosyncrasy things that even if you dated for a long time, you're just like, wow, I did not know that about you, Right? And, and so what we've got to understand is that sometimes love isn't easy, it's not always comfortable, and you, but you can learn to love. But you've got to be willing to put it on. You see, the Bible says, put on love, put on compassion, put these things on. In order to put that on, you've got to be willing to take some other things off. And you got to say, well, I'm going to lay aside, right, anger. I'm going to lay aside malice. I'm going to lay aside jealousy. I'm going to lay aside envy. I'm going to lay aside all these things. And so children, they will see, you know, their dad's shoes or their mom's shoes sitting there, and they'll put them on because, why? Because they've seen you wear it, and they want to be like you. Well, we've seen Jesus wear it. And if we are followers of Jesus, we, we should be saying, I want to be like you. I want to love like you. I want to lead like you. I want to live like you. But that's not always going to be easy. So let's look at Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 22 through 6, 4. A passage that we hear a lot, especially at weddings. And I've been able to officiate a lot of weddings and done a lot of marital counseling over the years. And we go through this passage a few times in counseling. And I think it's, it's interesting and it's, it's always helpful to talk about these things for people because there can be some misunderstandings especially when we're listening to just what the culture is saying about marriage and what the culture is saying about husbands and wives and what the Bible says because really it can be vastly different look at what the Bible says it says for wives this means submit and right there a lot of times people are pumping their brake <laughs> you, you got that word submit in there no, I don't. The Bible does. God does. And they're like, well, we don't like that word submit. I'm sorry. But let me tell you, let me explain something to you on why people don't like this word submit. Because they feel like it's oppressive. Because they feel like, you know, well, you know, we, we're in this, uh, this, this uh, you know, society where, where it's male dominated and all this. And it's like, well, let me, let me help you understand something. Right? God has set up a system God has set up a hierarchy of how he wants things to work. And he says it will work best if you do it this way. And so he says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Okay? So, so here's the thing. He's saying, wives, I'm asking you, I'm, I'm telling you that when you're submitting to your husband, you're doing it as unto the Lord. This is not, this is not saying that... The husband needs to be domineering over the wife. It's saying that she comes in as submissive, for the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. So what we need to understand here is that Jesus um, and is, is the head of this body of believers. It's not me. It's not our elders. 
It is Jesus who is the head of the church. The church, the people are his bride. All of us collectively, Jesus cares about all of us. Okay? And he says, he is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. You say, well, what if my husband wants me to do something that is not honoring to God? Well, then you don't do it. Because it goes back to as unto the Lord. The Lord is not going to ask you to do something that's dishonoring. And so if your husband is asking you to do something that's dishonoring, then you don't do it. Because you're to submit to your husband as to the Lord. So your, Lord, uh, your, your husband should be demonstrating godly attributes. And as he does, it's not a problem for you to submit. Amen? So this is not really about the wives. This is about the husbands. It's about the husbands being the people that you're supposed to be so that your wives will say, yes, dear, I don't have a problem submitting to you. Because you are seeking to be godly. You are seeking to be the man that God wants you to be. Amen, women? Amen. <laughs> it goes on now. Husbands, you thought it was over. No. For the husbands, this means love your wives. Now, yeah, amen. <laughs> you see, it, it goes back to the responsibility is on the husband. That if the husband is the person that he's supposed to be, the wife doesn't have a problem submitting. And the wife will not have a problem submitting when she is loved the way that she's supposed to be loved. Oh, yes, I hear the amens building. <laughs> and so when you think about this, right? Because, because listen, when we, get into, when we get into these kind of relationships, it can be a little dicey sometimes. It can, it can be tough sometimes to be the kind of person you're supposed to be. And sometimes, honestly, there's a lot of pressure. Because I do believe that if you're a godly husband, you want to you wanna do the right thing. You want to love. You want to serve. You want to you wanna be the person that God wants you to be. But, but, but we're all human. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things wrong. But if your wife knows that you love her, it's going to be much easier for her to submit to your authority, to your leadership. Look at what it says. It says, He gave up His life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's Word. He gave up His life. When it comes to marital relationships, one of the greatest challenges men are going to face is how much of your life are you willing to sacrifice? We all, we all have these goals, these dreams, right? We want, to, we want to pursue these dreams. We have these, these goals that we want to achieve that we've been dreaming of all of our life. And career sometimes can get in the way of family. But look at what it says. He gave up his life for her. I was reading a story the other day, and um, we're, we're going through a study with some of the guys on Tuesday nights, Disciplines of a Godly Man, and was talking about this, this uh, gentleman who was, uh, I think he was like a chancellor of a Christian college, something like that, and he'd been there for many years, like 30 or 40 years, and all of a sudden his wife came, well, not all of a sudden, but over a period of, of months, his wife developed dementia, and... Um, he was like, uh, it's time for me to retire. Um, even though he had been there for many years and still had uh, uh, several years that he could have served. But, but he said, no, you know, when we got married, we made vows to each other in sickness and in health. And he said, and so now she needs me more than ever. And so I'm going to lay aside my career and I'm going to go and take care of my wife and spend as much time with her as I can. And you know, when I read that story, I mean, it's such an admirable thing, isn't it? That when we see people who are willing to lay aside, do what the Bible says, that he gave up his life for her, just as Christ gave up his life for the church. And you know, it's not an easy thing to do, and I understand everybody may not be in that situation where they can do that, but, 
But I'm telling you this, that when we honor God with our marriages, when we honor God with our relationships, God is going to honor you. It says, he did this present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. You know, a lot of um, people around the first of the year, you know, we go through these resolutions and everybody's making all these things about diet and exercise. You know, we're going to go to the, to the gym, we're going to work out, you know, and do all this stuff. What? To build yourself up. And, and he's saying this, look, you're doing that because you love yourself. You, you're doing that because you're trying to be healthy. But what are you doing to try to save and, and be healthy in your marriage? Are you doing the things that you need to do to grow together? Are you working things out? You know, as the Bible says, work out your own salvation. Well, you, need, you might need to work out your own marriage. You might need to do a little exercise in your marriage. Do some things together that are going to help enhance your marriage. And this, again, should be something that shouldn't just be coming from the wife saying, hey, honey, you know, we ought to do this. Hey, honey, yeah. This should be, again, on the leadership of the men. Amen. That they should be engaging and initiating and saying, hey, this, this is what we need to do because I love you, I love us. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. One of the things that, you know, this week, even though I was sick, um, I didn't lose my appetite, praise God. And one of the things that happens a lot of times when you get sick, you know, you kind of lose your appetite. And, and so one of the ways that I knew I wasn't really that bad off was I was still hungry. <laughs> and, and, you know, the thing about it is this, is that are you hungry? Because if you're not hungry, you're sick. Some of y'all need to get hungry for your marriages again. Don't get sick. Right? Do it because no one hates his own body but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body, as the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife, and as he loves himself, and the wife uh, must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, you're not getting away with not being addressed either, right? The Bible is an all-inclusive book. It says, "Children, obey your parents." <laughs> really? I don't want to, right? <laughs> Do I have to? Yes, you have to. Because you, you don't obey your parents just because of your parents. You obey your parents because they're the parents that God gave you. You obey your parents and you say, well, what if my parents want me to do something that, that, that's wrong? Well, then you don't do it because you're, you're obeying God first. Okay? But, but if your parents love you, right, your parents are not going to ask you to do something that's not good or healthy for you. And so you have to trust that if you have loving parents, they're only going to ask you or they're only going to discipline you to do because of their love for you and according to what is good and right for you. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. Not Isn't that interesting? Not because you belong to them. It's because you belong to the Lord. Obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a student in here, right, you, you need to obey your parents because, well, your first priority is to God. And God says, obey your parents. Did you know that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? It's interesting that, that one of the Ten Commandments is geared towards children just obeying their parents. Why is that so important? Well, it's so important because we live in a society now where a lot of children don't obey their parents. We live in a society now where parents have abdicated their responsibilities and said, well, let somebody else raise my kids. Let's just put an iPad in front of them, right? Let's just put a pair of, you know, Apple Vision goggles on them and just let's pretend that they're in a different alternate reality. 
So it says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? Uh, you'll stay alive. <laughs> y'all, y'all remember it, right? It was Bill Cosby who said, right? I brought you in this world. I'll take you out, right? And so it's like, look, if you want to stay alive, right? <laughs> no. You don't have to live in that kind of fear. But this is, this is the reality, right? Is that, that God is trying to teach you a principle. That, that, listen, when you listen to your authorities, when you listen to people who are around you, who are older than you, who are trying to instruct, instruct you, your, your odds of living a longer life go up. When you just pay attention to the wisdom around you, when you just do what you're told to do, you have a better chance of living longer. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. But then it goes on and says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. You know, um, growing up, I didn't live with my dad, as uh, many of you know already. And there were a few times my dad and I, you know, had words, and, and we, we do as a lot of fathers and sons do. We argue and, and fight back and forth. But, um, but, you know, one of the things that, would have prevented some of that was just my dad being around a little bit more. And, and sometimes the relationship that we want to have with our children, <clears throat> and we're going to go through some very practical things here in just a moment, but sometimes the relationship that we want to have with our children could be handled much, much better by just spending a little bit more time together. Because, see, when we come in and we're just setting rules or we're just, we're just the disciplinarians, right, it just feels like, all you care about is being right instead of caring about the relationship. And so it's really important, and I think this, is, this verse is telling us, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them, that, that sometimes if the only way that you are interacting with your child is just the disciplinarian, then that's all they see you as. They don't see you as a loving father. They don't see you as a loving person in their life. And, and so it's really important for us to develop the relationship with people rather than just being the disciplinarian. It says, rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Listen, God is going to discipline us as a loving father. He's going to teach us. He's going to instruct us. He's given us his word. And when you don't follow the word, right, God's spirit is going to convict you. And God's going to discipline you. And sometimes that comes through other people. Sometimes it comes through just the Holy Spirit himself. Sometimes it could come in any number of ways, circumstances or whatever. But we've got to understand this, that discipline is part of life. And we shouldn't be afraid of discipline, knowing that when we're walking with the Lord, and even if we're out of line, his discipline right gets us back into line. In fact, Psalm 23 says, his rod and his staff, what, what do they do? They comfort me. You mean when I get a spanking, that's comfort? No, that don't, that's not comforting. I know it's not comforting. It's the comfort that comes after it when you realize, wow, somebody loved me enough to show me what was wrong. Okay? So let me give you some really practical things here today. Parents, you are still the single greatest influences of your children, even if your children are out of your house. And we understand that you are still the single greatest influencers in their lives. And so... It's important for you to take that responsibility seriously. However, there are a lot of people who abdicate this responsibility. And if you do, someone else will surely feel it. If you're not willing to be a positive influencer, if you're not willing to step into a gap and step into a void, I'm telling you, there are a lot of other people, a lot of other things that will fill that gap just like that. And so this, again, means that you have got to be intentional. You're going to have to take responsibility. You're going to have to step in, and sometimes you're going to have to pull your kids away from certain things. You know this already, that your children will do as you do, not always as you say. And they are going to be quick 
to point out to you, well, you're doing something that you told me not to do. And so I want to remind you, parents, adults, teachers, that it is important for you to model the behavior that you hope to see. It's not enough to just say it, and saying it once is not enough. You're going to have to repeat it over and over and over and over and over again. The same way it was done to you. That's how you learned it. And you think, oh, you know, I'm never going to say that to my kids. And what do you find yourself saying? The same thing you said you'd never say. You know why you say it? Because you heard it so much. And it worked. And so it's important for you to realize that you are going to have to do things over and over and over again. You are going to have to say things over and over and over again. This is one of the ways we learn through repetition. So don't get frustrated when you have to do it over and over and over again. Don't get frustrated when you have to say it over and over and over again. Because it's important for you to not underestimate the power of your influence in your family. And I'll say this, it doesn't matter if you have children or not. You're still influencing your family. You're still influencing people in your family. The way that you live, the way that you serve, the way that you give, the, even if you don't have children, right? The way that you love each other as a husband and wife is an example to your family, to the other people who know you. Because there are other people who are wishing their marriages would be a little bit better. And they're trying to see, well, they're Christians, let's see, uh, is their marriage any better? Are, are they, are, do they have some kind of connection with a God out there? How is that working for them? And so it's important for you to understand that you still have influence in your family, not just with your kids. The reality is that we all are being watched by someone even when you're not aware of it. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's, somebody's gauging how your relationship is with the other people around you. Somebody's seeing how you interact when you go out to a restaurant together. Somebody's seeing how you interact when you're walking through, you know, Walmart. You know, and, and, and it's, it's kind of funny because you can see some people, man, you know, and they, they let it all hang out at Walmart. I mean, they, they, they you know... And, and, and listen, there's some families, man, and I'm just going to tell you this. Some stuff does not need to be on Facebook. If you've got problems with your family, you need to keep it within your family. It doesn't need to be all over Facebook. I've seen some people, man, and they're posting all kinds of stuff about their family, this or that and the other, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness, come on, y'all. Come on. And you're supposed to be a Christian. You, do you think everybody else needs to see that? There is sometimes an intense pressure we apply to ourselves to be perfect parents. And this pressure causes us to act or react in ways that, we can, that can be detrimental to the health of our families. Listen, if you're feeling undue pressure because you feel like you're not measuring up, you're not living up or whatever, you need to talk to somebody. There are a lot of people who, uh, look, none of us are going to say we got it all figured out. If you got it all figured out, you're lying. You don't. But there are a lot of people who've been through some things that you can talk to. And if you feel like the pressure is getting to you, you feel like, you know, you're just, not, you're just not able to figure this out. Listen, learn to walk with some other people who've been down that road. Surround yourself with some people who can speak life and give you some guidance. You don't have to do it alone. But you are going to have to humble yourself. And say, I need some help. I don't know how to do this. I don't know why this keeps happening. I don't understand why I'm in this situation. Can you help me? There are no perfect parents, just like there are no perfect people. And so you can, you can take that weight off of having to be the perfect parent. You're not going to be the perfect parent. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up. You're not going to be the perfect spouse. Hello? Some of, y'all, some of y'all figure that out after you said, I do, right? Oh, they ain't perfect. And neither are you. You're not going to be perfect. So, so quit trying to be perfect. Again, this comes back to just move towards maturity. Move towards maturity and saying, okay, how, how am I supposed to love in the way that Christ has loved me? 
I'm going to say this about children can become overwhelmed by discouragement. And they'll look to you to speak words of life back to them. You know, our kids today, and it's a scary thing when, when you put yourself in their shoes of going to a school not knowing something crazy is going to happen today. We've had it happen recently in several schools lately. And there's a lot of discouraging things that can happen at school. Bullying being one of the top things. And you know, we've got to be careful because God has entrusted children to you and their lives and their hearts are fragile. It's important for you to speak words of life to them because your encouragement to your spouse or to your children is invaluable. There are some things that you can say now that will stick with them for the rest of their lives. So don't underestimate the power of your words. Even though they may not remember the words you said, though often they will, they will certainly remember the way you made them feel. And so you need to understand, whether it's with your spouse or with your children, you need to nurture these relationships. You need to, you need to bring a sense of feeling, a sense of warmth and love to your home. And don't get in, uh, discouraged when you're not getting encouraged back. Right? Sometimes it's like, well, you know, I'm always the one who's saying the, the nice things. I'm always the one doing this. Well, look, be the one who's always doing it. Don't get discouraged when you don't get it back. Just keep doing the right thing. It's not always going to feel right to do what's right, but do it anyway. Sometimes when we're dealing with Children, and I've been in student ministry for years and years, and I've seen these kind of things, and I hate sometimes, I hate the way that a lot of school sports and, you know, rec sports goes because there's a lot of shaming and blaming. And so I want to encourage you to be, be careful of the shame and approval methods of influencing. That you're only, only really happy when your kid does well on the team. You're only really happy when your kid brings home, you know, an A. But you really need to celebrate the effort. You need to celebrate, right, their gifting. You need to celebrate their, their attempts at certain things. Because, listen, there's so much discouragement. There's so much competition out there that the only voice that may be speaking something good and encouraging to them might be your voice. I uh, appreciate Al and his sons coaching their sports teams and trying to be a voice of positivity, you know, and we need more of that in our world today. These coaches who are out there screaming at kids and only excited about a win is really sad. And so it's important for us to make sure that we're doing all that we can do to encourage our children around us. We need to be careful with our words and our actions because these are two things that you cannot undo. Sometimes, you know, in that moment, you got those words coming out of your mouth and you're just like, uh, you can't take it back. You can't take it back, so be careful with what you say and what you do. Another thing that's really important is uh, physical touch. And we need to have appropriate physical touch you don't have to be afraid to give a hug. You know, I'm not a hugger. I'm not a hand holder. Some people, you know, always want to pray. Oh, let's hold hands. I'm like, do we have to? <laughs> I'm like, can't we just do the holy huddle? You know, it's just... <laughs> I've gotten over that now, but, you know. But some people, you know, you're not... Maybe you didn't grow, come from families like that where hugging or, you know, a physical touch like that was, was normal or natural. But, but let me encourage you to try to move towards that because so many people today don't have any idea of what a, a hug feels like. There are a lot of people today who are in jails. Man, they haven't had, I mean, aside from a fight, they haven't had any positive physical contact with anybody. 
It might be uncomfortable at first, but it's better to be uncomfortable now than to have regrets later. And, and let me tell you that, you know, most kids, even, even teenagers, you know, when you go to hug them, they can be like, well, hug them anyway. <laughs> hug them anyway, okay? Because the time's going to come when you won't be able to do it. So do it anyway. Be present in people's presence. Being present in people's presence is more powerful than you realize. Sometimes you just need to put the phone down. Sometimes you just need to turn the phone off. Sometimes you need to turn the TV off and just be together. Sometimes you just need to get away and be together and actually talk to one another. Being present is important. And I know for many of us, we think we're so good at multitasking, but, but you know the studies prove that you're just fooling yourself. You're not getting more done by multitasking. Your brain is a single focus brain. Okay? And so you can fool yourself all you want by saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here at your game. Yeah, and, it's, and look, all that's communicating is they're not as important to you as what you're doing on your phone. When you're at a restaurant, don't just, don't, don't just flip it upside down. Don't put it in the little jail, you know. People want to play games like that with it or whatever, you know. The first one who looks pays for the bill. Leave your phone in the car. Some of y'all just even saying that is giving you anxiety. What? I can't. Uh, what? No. Are you kidding me? That's why you need to leave it in the car. Because if, that, if, if that's making you feel that way already, you, you, you've got a problem. Not the same way. But listen, you've got, we've got to start weaning ourselves away from some of the technology and start getting back to some, connect, some real connectivity. Because if we believe that being present with someone really matters, then we are allowing too much room for distractions. It's not a matter of quantity versus quality. Your spouse and your kids need both. Some people say, oh, I just give them, you know, I give them quality time. How are you going to give them quality time in five minutes? Right? 30 minutes. No, that's not quality time. You, you need both. And really, right, it's, it's more, more shows more. Why are you spending more time with me? Well, that means, wow, you know, I'm really more important to you than all this other stuff. So we've got to do both to communicate that. And what you're saying yes to is what you're saying yes to, causing you to say no to your family. You see, you're going to steal from somewhere. You're going to steal from work. You're going to steal from home. You're going to take time from somewhere. But let me remind you, a few weeks ago we had that hourglass up here. Time is ticking. And you don't get it back. And so you need to be wise with what you're going to do with your time. I'm going to move on and give you a few uh, last little things here. Boundaries are necessary for children to learn accountability and responsibility. Don't be afraid to set some boundaries. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is as far as you go. And if you go over that, then there's going to be some consequences. But this is the problem, parents, is that you don't always keep your end of the bargain. You don't always follow through with the consequences. And that's part of the problem, is that you've got, if you set a boundary and it gets crossed, there has to be a follow-through. And you don't just give it up and say, oh, well, you know, yeah, okay, uh, I, I said that week, so it's been four days. Well, you know, that's close to a week, so no. A week is a week. Define that on the front end. A week means five days? We're we talking a working week or we're we talking seven days, a whole week? Be clear. Be very specific 
in the boundaries and the guidelines you're going to set. Because they need to learn responsibility and accountability. This is why we've got some problems in schools today with kids. It's because the teacher can say something, but what is the teacher? It doesn't matter what the teacher says. My parents let me get away with whatever. So you're not my mom. You're not my dad. You're not going to tell me what to do. And this is part of the problem is that there's no accountability at home, so there can't be any accountability anywhere else. And so it's important for us. What's that? Yeah, at work too. Yeah. Uh, we were talking, I was just talking to this with someone else, right? Is that sometimes, you know, now we've, we've let people just come, they can wear whatever they want to, to work. And it's like, isn't that, it's cra- kind of crazy, isn't it? It's like, man, I thought you were a professional. You know, David Ballard's a lawyer over here. And uh, David, <laughs> you know, you, you go you come in to, you, to work wearing your pajamas, David? You, you, probably not. If he's got pajamas on, he's still going to have a tie, right? Because that's, that's what you expect out of lawyers, right? You, you don't go look at, look, if I went to a lawyer and he had on his pajamas, I'm walking right out. Right? Because it's like, no, man, you don't look like, a, you're not serious about your job. You, you, you think your job's a joke. Oh, I'm just being comfortable. It's my, you know, we, we just got these, you know, casual Fridays. Well, it's like every day is casual Friday around here, right? In our society now, everybody just wears whatever they want to wear, and it's like, no, look. This is why I dress, you know, it's like sometimes, yeah, I want to come in here, not my, my pajamas on, but, you know, I want to come in here with like a sweatshirt or something sometimes. It's so cold. <laughs> and, but it's like, no, I got to take my job seriously. This is a serious job. And I'm re- representing the Lord. It's like I got to look like, you know, I'm representing the Lord. And sometimes, right, when we think about going in, into a business, a place of, 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 you know, that's supposed to be offering some kind of professional uh, help or assistance, and it's like, my goodness, y'all don't, you don't take your job seriously. Why should I take you seriously? You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and so when we think about this, right, as we're communicating all kinds of things by the way that we act, the way that we dress, the way that we talk, all these things communicate. And so, listen, I, and I'll just say this, and i got to keep moving, is that if you don't take your life seriously, nobody else will. You don't take your marriage seriously, nobody else will. You don't take your kids seriously, nobody else will. And so it's important for us to really be serious about these things that are important to us. And so let me give you these five things to help you. Take some time to create some traditions in your family. You want to have a better relationship in your family? Then create some traditions. And say, oh, well, you know, uh, our family's so spread out. Well, go ahead and start now and just do something. And say, hey, you know, this day, this is what we're going to do. Look, Valentine's Day was on Wednesday, but it don't have to be on Wednesday. February the 14th, you can celebrate love every day. Pick a day that's going to work for you. And say, hey, as a family, this is the day we're going to celebrate love. That, hey, you know, Christmas, okay, it's December 25th, but we all know everybody can't always be together together on December 25th. You know what? People ain't got a problem with celebrating on the 26th either. Ask your kids. They'll take presents every day. (laughs) Right? So, so here's the thing. It's right. Create your own traditions with your own family. And it's okay if other people around your neighborhood don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. It's okay. They don't need to understand. Why, why are you doing that as a family? Well, this is what we do. This is who we are. And this is, this is what's helping us. Okay? It might not work for you, but this is what's going to help us. Capture memories. Now, I know a few minutes ago I was talking about, you know, putting your phone down. Put them all down but one. <laughs> Create some memories. Capture some special moments. Make sure you do that. Right? You guys remember, um, many of you have had VHSs and Hi 8s. Pull out that VCR. Let me go way back. Some of y'all had those slides, you know. <laughs> In the, uh, yeah, the reels, yeah. So, so look. You need to create some of these and, and play them back 
for a birthday. Go back. Don't just wait until you get married, till they're getting married to play them all back. No, do it every year. Go back and relive some of those special times. Calendar, vacations and staycations. I'm going to tell you this. This is what I tell people that I counsel all the time. If you don't put it on the calendar, it's not going to happen. There's always a reason that your family is going to tell you, oh, well, y'all can take your vacation another time. Oh, you don't need to have that date night. I mean, y'all can take a date night any night. And your family's going to infringe. Your family's going to say, oh, come on, we really need you here for this or that. No. Look, if you got it on the calendar, nobody needs to know what your appointment is. And if it's a date with your spouse, nobody else needs to know. I'm sorry, I'm busy. I've got an appointment that night. Okay? So calendar it, put it on there, and nobody else needs to know about it. And don't always think that you've got to go away for some expensive vacation to have a great time. Sometimes staying home, <laughs> right, I heard, no, right? Right, because sometimes this is what we equate, right, the status of our relationship, oh, we're spending a lot of money on each other. No, sometimes the, that's the worst thing you can do. You already got a lot of debt. You don't need more debt. Going on a vacation and spending a lot of money is only going to make you feel worse when you come home. Because part of the problem, and listen, we all know this from financial, uh, I mean, from uh, marital counseling, is that the greatest reason for most divorces is financial. Financial. So why would you go on a major vacation and spend a lot of money if you're already having problems? It's not the answer. Staying home, cutting up the credit card, paying off your debt, all right, and being creative in your staycation. Some cheerful excursions, right? Just get out and do some fun things together, right? You, listen, the older we get, sometimes we forget what it was like to be a kid. But you know what your kids need? Your kids need to see you being a kid again. Your kids need to see you having fun. Your kids need to see you throwing water balloons. They need to see you running down the slip and slide. I, I know some of you are like, oh, you know, my hip, my back. my yeah. Okay, well, you don't have to do the slip and slide. But, but there are some other things that you can do to show that you're still a kid. That, to show that you can still have some fun, right? You don't have to be the old curmudgeon sitting in the armchair. No, don't you run through this house. Right? My grandparents, you know, get out of this house. Get out there. You know. It's like, no. Have some fun with your kids. Have some cheerful excursions. Just out of the blue, right? Be spontaneous. When was the last time you were spontaneous? Uh, there's a song by uh, Switchfoot. I love Switchfoot. And um, one of those songs goes like this. When was the last time you did something as though it was the first time? When was the last time you did something as though it was the first time. You know, a lot of times we, we suck the joy out of things because we're like, oh, we've already done that. Well, if it was fun, do it again. Choose time together. This is one way you can communicate and build your family relationships is just choosing to spend time together. There's nothing more valuable than time together. I know that this has been a lot of just all kinds of things this morning. But I hope it's been practical for you. I don't know how the Lord has spoken to you, but band, you guys come on up. And I want to encourage you this morning that there might be some things that you need to do differently as you move forward as a family, as you move forward in your marriage relationships. But it's all going to start with you making an individual decision to say, I'm going to be the person I need to be. Because it really does boil down to your individual decisions of saying, God, I, I want to be the person you've called me to be in this relationship or in my community. Because, listen, I know that we've got several single people here in the church too. But that doesn't mean that you don't have influence. It doesn't mean that you can't be a mentor, a role model in somebody's life. I get the opportunity to do that often. And I want to encourage you that 
if that is your situation, if you don't have kids, listen, it doesn't mean that you can't. You're just going to have to find some. And there are plenty around who are looking for someone to love them. So however it is the Lord has spoken to you today, let me encourage you with your relationship status. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be broken. It can be better. But it starts with you. Let's pray. God, we pray this morning as we've looked at your word. Jesus, you're our example. You laid down your life for us. And God, you've told us that there's no greater love than this, that a, that a person would lay down his life for his friends. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to see how we can better represent you in our relationships with those around us. God, there are people who are watching us all the time. Many times we're not aware of the influence that we're having by the way that we turn to you when, when problems come, by the way that we handle things when our kids are struggling or even out of control. But God, you're the perfect parent. And so, Father, I pray that you help us to look to you where does our help come from? It comes from you, the maker of heaven and earth. You are the perfect parent. So God, may we learn how to do life better. Thank you for loving us, God. Thank you for the instruction that you give us in your word. We pray that you would help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening. To learn more about us, please visit our website at newvisionc.com and our socials at New Vision Church and NVC Next Gen. Just look for the round Broken V logo and we'll see you soon. God bless.